Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, PodcastOne.com, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it. No matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That guy over there, Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Hello. How are you, sir? Doing good. Listen, I got to tell you, I've had a lot of people reach out to me after a video that I posted earlier this week, Tim. Mm-hmm. People concerned for my mental acuity, <laughs> my sanity levels. Uh-huh. I think maybe they just need to watch the video themselves. Yeah, yeah judge for themselves because mm-hmm. uh you know what am i really crazy tim or mm-hmm. am i on to something am i on something or am i on to something tim that's what i want to know that's what i need to know that's what i demand to know tim i i just think maybe you got into the cooking wine uh, I, I think no, you're okay that's been gone for weeks oh. that's been that's been gone for weeks but i have gotten into the uh, cleaning supplies i bought two bottles of everclear ah, for cleaning yeah, yeah. And, and it helps me think better tim it, it opens my mind and allows me to freeform think and i think that video uh shares that pretty well yeah you were riffing that's yeah what, that's what we call it in the business riffing i was in a zone yeah if you would all right listen we know everybody's going a little crazy nowadays because of the crisis going on around the world because of what position we're in and the fact that you know many of us for the first time perhaps in our lives are really kind of homebound and just having to deal with that part of the situation but i have a i have an interesting question for you tim okay as crazy as it gets kind of being stuck in our homes, which we've mentioned on the air, it's not so bad for us in Minnesota because we're we're kind of used to self-isolation mm-hmm. uh, for about seven months of the year because of the brutal cold and snow and ice and, and all the other things we tell you people around the United States it happens here so you don't move to our state. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we, we're pretty much in isolation for seven months a year anyway. So it's it's not been a big shift for us. You know, there's been some weird ups and downs, but... Tim, imagine if not only you were isolating, but you were isolating in probably one of the most famous haunted houses on the planet. Imagine that sincere feeling of just being there, entrenched in it. Not much of a break, Tim. I mean, it sounds like The Shining, right? Right. Right. Do you think that's something you could do? Would you would you want to self isolate in a, in an extremely active, well known haunted home with you and your family for any period of time? I mean, not just a weekend, not just a week, but let's say I don't know six to eight weeks or p- perhaps longer. Tim, would that be something you think you could handle? Well, you said something key there, Dave. I what? myself, as a solitary person, could probably mentally go longer than most but then you include the family and there's an aspect there that you know things start to break <laughs> down a little bit yeah it starts turning into a lord of the flies yeah. at the dentist home yeah exactly yeah well there's something pretty exciting coming up um and i wanted to uh to talk about this on the air and it's something that you and i will be a part of uh, as we're doing it uh, today breaking this uh, on our show um I think it's fair to say, Tim, the Conjuring movie has become one of our favorite ghost story horror movies in at least 15 to 20 years. Oh, yes. All right. If you haven't seen The Conjuring, obviously you've been living in some kind of weird self-isolation already. Open yourselves up. Watch it. If you love horror movies, you love a good ghost story, check out The Conjuring. Now, through the years, we've visited with the Perrin family uh, specifically Andrea Perrin on this show. And we've discussed 
different aspects of that story and the house and the haunting and what really took place there. We've discussed it before the Conjuring movie came out. We've discussed it since the Conjuring movie came out. Well, after the Conjuring movie came out. But in in all honesty, we've really only had really two glimpses into this story, Tim. Mm -hmm. We've had Andrea and Roger Perrin and their family story, right? Right. And then we had the woman who took over the house. And I don't want to mention names again because I, I, I know she's had her own issues with the popularity and fame that came along with the movie, the conjuring. Um, but we've heard her story and at first it appeared as though she was on board and that, you know, she talked freely about some of the, the strange supernatural things that occurred. Then she, she pulled back as the movie grew in popularity and claimed that nothing happened there and that it was all hype and movie nonsense. And, and that leaves a lot of people sitting back scratching their heads. However, she promoted it and talked about it long before the movie came knocking. As a matter of fact, um, her family, I believe was, uh, involved in the episode of ghost hunters Mm -hmm. that went to visit in season one or two and, and had a chance to investigate the haunting claims. Well, Tim, there's a new family that has purchased that home and are living there and are now in self isolation quarantined into the conjuring house and the dark zone is something I've been a part of for the last five years. And we've helped provide some really cool content and fun things over at the dark zone dot TV. And, uh, they've got something coming up, Tim, that is unprecedented. What if we could help you, our lovely listeners get access to the conjuring home. Oh, I know you can't get out there. You can't put yourself physically into that home. But what if, what if you could from the safety and sanctity of your own home, have a look inside that house to see the activity going on, to be a part of the haunting itself. Well, in, in a move that's spectacular, the new family that lives there has agreed to open their homes and their lives for just that purpose. And this is pretty exciting opportunity, Tim. I mean, you and I have talked about, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could get out there? Oh, yeah. And thankfully, we've lived vicariously through the Ghost Adventures guys, mm-hmm. apps, and uh, kindred spirits who've all had a chance to go out there and investigate this house and, uh, and be a part of it. But, you know, that that's one thing. But being part of an interactive, live kind of almost like a paranormal conference is, is something totally new and exciting. The house live stream project is basically a week long virtual paracon coming from, as we said, one of the most haunted houses in America during this lockdown, the Heinzens, the new owners of the home are queer quarantined there, Tim. And, and now they're willing to open their house up to the paranormal community. They will be conducting investigations and various experiments. They'll also be joined by several special guests from the paranormal community throughout the week. The event will broadcast exclusively on the Dark Zone Network, which can be found at thedarkzone.tv. We have a link for that on today's program, so make sure you check it out. Starting May 8th, Tim, for a free preview. You can go check it out. And the subscription broadcast starts May 9th and ends on May 16th. Pre-sales start tomorrow, and you can buy access at thedarkzone.tv. And much of the proceeds are going to actually be donated to various COVID-19 charities, which I thought was phenomenal. Oh, yes. A great way to get a chance to gaze inside this house, be a part of the paranormal community, and kind of have this interesting um, access to the home. So joining us on today's program, normally reserved for Supernatural News and Parashare, this is kind of the ultimate Parashare, Tim. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, We're going to do some Supernatural News later on today after this interview, so stay tuned for that, and we have some of your calls. But joining us uh, at the beginning of the show, we have Corey and Jennifer Heinzen, and uh, they're here to discuss living in this home and why they would open up and allow the world this unbelievable glimpse into their existence. So welcome to the show. Uh, Corey Heinzen, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for having us, guys. 
It's great. Jennifer, thank you for joining us as well. No, thank you. Thank you. We're excited. All right. So let's let's dive into this. First of all, you know, it, it's interesting because Tim and I have joked, people have, um, you know, the people that go in and they bought the Amityville Horror House, right? They, they shake their fist in righteous indignation and they roll their eyes at people that dare to drive by and take photographs of the house or that are interested in the house. And Tim and I have said, well, when you buy one of the most famous legendary haunted houses on the planet, how can you get mad that people are interested in it and, right. and, and out there. And now there's a difference between your home and, and the home in Amityville, the home in Amityville literally is like any little town suburbia. It's a house right on a street. Like most of us grew up on picture the leave it to beaver town folks. Uh, and, uh, and, and Mayberry, how the houses are right there off of the sidewalk. Literally, if you're standing on the sidewalk in front of the Amityville Horror House, you could lob a newspaper from the sidewalk onto the uh, front uh, stoop there without any effort. So it's very close and accessible. But but the people, to me, that crack me up are the ones that, that have bought the house, and then they're mad that people uh, actually show an interest in it or or want to know more about it. You obviously knew what you were getting yourselves into. What made you decide... You know, honey, let's let's buy the conjuring house. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, are you, it, did you were you paranormal enthusiasts uh, prior to this purchase, or were you just fans of the movie? Oh, we've been paranormal investigators for the past ten years, give or take. And you decided, boy, this would be the ultimate opportunity is to actually own a haunted house, which is amazing. And I'm, I'm thrilled that somebody with passion and conviction for this actually bought this house and, and is willing to uh, allow these uh, access points. Um, Jennifer, did it take much convincing to get you to want to go along and, and purchase this house? Um, actually, it really didn't. Um soon as I saw the house, I fell in love and I actually didn't think any of it would actually really go through. It was kind of like one of those things where you think you want it and you don't let yourself get too excited because you just don't think it'll ever happen. So I just kind of went with it thinking, all right, this will never happen anyways, but it did and we love it. Now you, you both were paranormal investigators before this. So had you had a life kind of surrounded in the supernatural each of you or or did the investigations kind of come up because of the popularity of the different shows and and all of the teams that began to spring up across the world uh i had an experience uh back in 2001 on a battlefield down in fredericksburg virginia that i couldn't ever explain and there was like 50 of us that witnessed it and apparently it's like the norm for like to hear gunfire and screaming and stuff out on, on a battlefield at two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, I just, ever since then, I just been like fascinated by it, but where I was in the military and I've had a chance to really explore into it because we we're always on the go. So now can you tell us a little bit more? What was the actual experience like? What, what happened to you? Um, we were out on w one of the battlefields. We were doing a walk and talk. And what that is, is we go out there, we spend the night with bivouac out on the field. And then the next morning we get the tour and then we kind of split up in the groups and how would we have done the battle differently, knowing our strategies and stuff like that. So anyways, that night we were w all sleeping probably two o'clock in the morning. You just hear cannon fire, gunshots and screaming and stuff. And, like I said, there's 50 of us out there witnessing this and nobody can explain anything. You're not seeing any gunfire in the tree line or anything. And the tour guy came out the next morning. He's like, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. And it's like, since when? When does this happen? I'm like, this is new. I've never heard of this. And he's like, oh, yeah, go to Gettysburg. Go to this. Go to that. I was like, wow. So... You, you have this experience. You, I mean, there's no denying it. As you said, it wasn't maybe just a hallucination or a waking dream because there's a large group of you that are all experiencing this type of uh, phenomena. What, what was that like? How did that change you? 
I mean, it's it's hard to really wrap your head around it, to be honest. I mean, you know, when you got people that are like genuinely scared and then there's other people that are just trying to rationalize it. And then, you know, it's like it's kind of like waking up on Christmas and going downstairs and seeing Santa Claus, like putting gifts underneath your tree, even though, you know, you're 20 years old and you're like, what the, you know, it's something you were told never existed. You know, these aren't real. You know, ghosts aren't real. Demons aren't real. And yet we're dealing with this stuff. Now, Jennifer, what about you? Uh, what, what was your first paranormal experience? Uh, Corey kind of dragged me into it once he started to have the passion for it. Uh, we have a local community center here in, uh, when we're in Maine, where we, where we both grew up, we had a local community center where everyone always talked about how haunted it was. So that's kind of the first place where I started going. And it's not until you experience it yourself that you're really like, you know, I, I can see Corey's passion for it. I can see how much he loves it. But once you start doing it yourself, it, you kind of get the bug for it. I mean, he went on more investigations than I did. I am not one to like to stay up late at night. I'm I'm an early bird, so I'm sleeping by 7, 8 o'clock half the time. So it's hard for me to go out as much as he did. But it is it is once you experience things and once you it, it experience it for yourself, it's so much different. And can you tell us what, you know, what was your first experience? What, what really kind of cemented the fact that this isn't just, uh, you know, crazy people thinking they're having an experience, but no, my God, this is a, this is a real paranormal moment for me. The first time he took us to the GRCC, um, there was actually, it was with his parents and our kids and it was kind of more of a, let's see what happens and let me show you that this stuff is real. So you hear noises you hear knocks but in your mind you try and rationalize okay that it's an old building it could be pipes it could be this but when he pulled out a spirit box and he started asking questions and you start hearing these responses that you even again you start rationalizing your head it, well maybe it's just it could be this could be that but once he started asking specific questions uh, my dad passed away when I was younger and when you get feedback about what his nickname is that isn't something that they would normally say on the radio or specific responses. That's when, that's when I became a believer. All right. So you've got this, um, pretty remarkable opportunity, uh, you know, if, after being investigators to get unfettered access to a, a very famous home, were you skeptical, um, of the, the, the claims that had come to, you know, from this home before you decided to purchase it? Um, kind of, we, we visited, we visited the house twice before we, we ended up finalizing everything and we loved the property. We loved the house. We loved everything about it, but there were only a few times where you get that feeling in your stomach, like, okay, this feels really funny, but it's, it didn't feel scary or haunted or like it was going to, it's kind of like one of those things where you expect to walk into a house and be like, oh my God, I my heart's going to race so fast that I'm just going to start running out. And when you don't feel that, it's kind of like, okay, is this really real? Is it really, but we loved it. It, it drew us to it anyways. So it's kind of like, you know, you are kind of nervous. Like it's, you know, are things really going to happen? But the day we moved into the house, things already started happening. So then you get that kind of feeling like, okay, it is real. Really? So things started for you immediately upon entering the home? Yes, yeah, so the day we purchased the house after we came back from the signing, once we, you know, once it's yours and you get the keys and you get to walk in and kind of explore around, things were already starting to happen. Well, can you uh, talk to us if you if you don't mind? Um, you know, the, I don't know how how deeply you want to go into this, but the previous owners, uh, the the family that owned it after the Perrin family, um, yeah. were they? You know, did did you talk to them about the activity? Did they seem forthcoming with it, or were they still denying that any of this ever took place? We actually never even talked about it with her at all. We kind of didn't dare to ask questions because we weren't really sure what kind of responses we would get, and she really didn't. She wasn't really forward with any of the information, anyways. There was a point in time where she asked us, "You do know what house this is, right?" and she knew Corey was a paranormal investigator and 
that's what our family had done for a long time. So we just kind of didn't talk about it. We just, we got the feeling that she either didn't want to talk about it or it just was never brought up. So we didn't push anything either. We didn't want to, it, it was awkward, I guess. We just didn't talk about it. She didn't have any reservations in selling the house to you, knowing that you had an interest in a, a fascination in the paranormal? No, no, no. All right. So you've got, um, you've got the house. You say things start for you the moment you take possession. Now, in visiting the house, did you ever have any kind of strange senses? And, and I guess then that begs the question, how do you separate what you're expecting from what's actually taking place there was, do you, you know what I'm saying? You go in kind of understanding right. what this story is. Do you get yeah. over that fear? Um, or, or do you really sense there is something there from just your visit? I, I, I think we walked in expecting to feel something that scared us. And it was, it, there was only one point in time in one room that I walked into where you get that kind of funny feeling in your stomach and you just start to, not that it, it wasn't even scary. It was just like a, a feeling that you get, but it, I expected it to scare me and it didn't. The only thing I remember from the first time we visited is when we were walking the land, I did, it, it was really weird and somebody else, it's a weird story anyways, but we were walking the land and I walked into the open field at the bottom and I saw what I thought was like a shed out in the woods. And I thought to myself, that's a really weird spot to put a shed because it looked like an old, it wasn't like a big wood shed. It was almost like a, I don't know, like an outdoor outhouse type shed, just a wooden top. And it was just a weird placement. So I thought to myself, that's really weird. But we kept walking. Corey was behind me talking with somebody else and I was in front just kind of looking at everything taking it all in and I look at the shed was gone so I I thought to myself that that is just weird that was the first time I was like okay this is really strange um somebody else that was there with us also about 15-20 minutes later and I didn't even say anything to them um said that same comment I that was weird I thought there was a shed over there and I looked and it was gone so that's the only weird thing I guess that happened for me when we first moved in. I don't know about Corey. He, yeah, Corey, what, what about you? I mean, walking, walking the property, going there before you make the purchase, did you get a sense of anything there or did you get more of the sense of just the, uh, the familiarity of the story? Uh, it, it was more of a, like as soon as you walk in, you're already amped up because it's like, okay, this is, you know, where it all went down and, you know, all hell broke loose and, and stuff like that. So you're trying to like get over that and try not to have any like pre uh, precognition, like feelings on stuff. And the heaviness that was in the one room, as soon as you walk in, it was real palpable and throughout the house. And what was weird was, the owner was staying in just basically two rooms out of the entire house. I mean, the the whole house is 3,100 square feet. And she was like in this small, small room, like living room, and then used like another room for a bedroom. And the rest of like the proper, if you want to say the farm, but like the original, the original part was like basically bar- not barricaded off, but she had the door shut and it was closed. So, like, as soon as you walked in there, I mean, there was dust on everything, and, like, she wasn't going into that section of the house for some reason. And it was either to preserve, you know, the the house or something else. I, I don't know. So Now, talk to me about uh, taking possession of this house. And I, I, I don't mean that as a pun, but, you know, when you finally get this, what what is the first inclinations that, oh, God, there is something here. Well, I mean, once once we bought it and we signed the paperwork on it and we walked in and the first thing that happened, one of the doors opens just out of the blue. And, you know, and everybody witnesses it. And I'm like, okay, we got to document this, you know, because, like, we didn't go down there with, like, suitcases full of clothes. We went down there with, like, pelican cases full of spirit hunting gear and stuff like that so it was like we got to document this because 
I'm so sick and tired of seeing movies that are based on a true story, but you see nothing about it. You know, there's no real evidence or anything. There's just like word of mouth and stuff like that. And it's like, let's document supposedly what the parents witnessed here, what the Warrens witnessed here and, you know, shut up the skeptics. And that's been our whole, that's been our whole goal, bringing people in, into the, into the house and, you know, putting the videos out that we do is, you know, just to try to silence the skeptics on it. Now, is it to silence the skeptics or to prove to yourself this is haunted? Because that is a difference, right? I mean, silencing the skeptics means that you're already going in with this preconceived notion. It is definitely haunted. There is something that's going to happen here. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people would stand back and say, well, that's not being very objective. Uh, or were you just trying to not necessarily disprove the paranormal, but, you know, just try to see if there was any logical explanations for the things that were taking place. I mean, that, that, I guess that's a, that's a better way of putting it. You know, it's trying to, you know, try to rationalize what's going on because there were things going on in that house that I've never, you know, in my, you know, 10 years is just like a minor time but I've never had happened to me before, you know, like bursts of light in a room. And when I say burst of light, I mean, it's bright and you know, there's no, there is no light source in that room. You know, you have to bring in like a, a lamp, a plug in lamp, you know, but yet you got like flash bulbs going off in the room. It's, it's so, okay. With that said, flash bulbs, is it a little pop of light or is it like, like somebody flicks on an entire light for a second and the whole room is lit? The whole room is lit. It's I compare it to like somebody with like the old school flash bulbs for the cameras. Sure. And then you get that real quick and it'll light up the entire room most of the time. But what's neat is there'll be like a little, a little blue orb sitting there and then it'll sizzle out. It'll like, and then it'll like kind of pop, but then all of a sudden it'll happen like somewhere else in the room. You know, we've been documenting this like, and there's only been one other place I've ever seen it on, like on a on a TV show, and that was uh, Sir No Face. They documented it on that uh, that documentary. All right, so you see this this light. Are you hearing anything when it when it happens? Do you smell anything? Do you feel anything during these experiences as well? Uh, you it, it, you kind of get the smell of like. Uh, like ozone, like it, like it, if you were to use an air purifier, like that, that smell okay. that you get from an air purifier, that's, that's what I smell. I like, I can't speak for everybody else, but those are like the things that I notice. But. All right. Now, what about you, Jennifer? I mean, what was the first few moments like for you when you realized uh, there is more to this story than just Hollywood imagination or a, uh, a family that uh, might have been, you know, predisposed to, to anxiety and fear. I at first nerve wracking because you really don't know what to expect. Um, I mean, we clearly know what we're doing most of the time, but you really don't know what to expect when it comes to a lot of this. So when things started happening pretty quickly like that, you kind of pull yourself back and you're like, do I really want to be here all the time? Do I really want to, like, what do we expose ourselves to? So, I mean, we really had taken it really slow, especially last summer. Like we, we still have a house up in Maine. So it's, we had options to be able to leave. Like Corey spent a lot more time down there in the summertime than I did because you really don't know what to expect. And we didn't want to expose the kids to anything that they didn't feel comfortable being part of. Did you have that discussion before moving in? Hey guys, we might be buying the, the conjuring house. Yeah. Yeah. And how, think, how old think, are your kids? Um, one of them is 20. Um, and our son is, uh, 17. So they're older and both of them have been doing this right along with us this whole time. So it's not like they've never been exposed to it. So the notion of buying the house was exciting even to them to begin with. Our oldest, Madison, was in college, so she knew she wouldn't be moving into it. She was just excited to be part of it because she was still up in Maine going to college. But the it's the excitement of knowing what you're going to be doing. But I think 
the excitement. It's not that it died down when you buy the house, but you, the more you, the more time you spend there, the, the weirder it gets, I guess. So she's kind of freaked out by it. All right. Do you um, do you have any experiences, you know, aside from kind of the shock and awe of, oh, you know, we are sharing this space with something abnormal. Is there ever a moment in that first few weeks where you or your family or, or anybody that's visiting feel threatened or or terrified by what's happening there? Well, go ahead with that one, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know... Uh, our son had an experience um, one night and he was supposed to be down there for a paracon with us. And uh, he ended up uh, leaving early. He spent one night and he was like, yep, I'm, I'm leaving. And we, he never said anything to us, but come to find out he ha- ended up having a black mass like form like above his head. And I mean, there was like six of us all sleeping in this one room because it was so hot, you know, it, it, the only place we had not that it was, was so hot room. it was so scary that we didn't sleep in the other part of the house yet we weren't scared <laughs> <laughs> she's lying we all slept in one part uh, of the house because we called it the safe room Lori <laughs> listen to you you've been out it son <laughs> don't listen to her she don't know what she's talking I, about I believe Tim I don't know you, I need you to weigh in on this I believe we just heard the actual truth uh, yeah. occur right and then Tim what do you think yeah yeah I think you've been outed Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, Jennifer, we oh. believe you. We believe you. It's okay, Corey. <laughs> Listen, Corey sorry. <laughs> you be the toughest guy on the planet and, and still have moments where you get unnerved by things. That makes us human, my friend. So I, I prefer the truth of this. So you did, uh, you, you kind of partitioned yourselves off as well from. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's no line. I mean, there's, there's a part of you that, like, it's like, I'm not going to go in there, like, thump my chest and say, you know, hey, bring it on and stuff like that. Like, it's like we want to be on the same wavelength as them and, you know, try to live in peace and harmony with them and stuff like that. Because it was like, I saw it like I read what happened to the parent family and it's like, I'd rather not go down that road. So let's try to like attempt, uh, approach this differently. You know, we'll communicate with them, interact with them. You know, sometimes maybe all they want to do is be heard. But anyways, going back to what happened to Kyler, he had a big black mass. <laughs> he had a big black mass <laughs> develop over him. And he just sat there, didn't say anything. It just sat there for a few minutes and then it dissipated. But the next morning he had my sister drive down from, from Maine and pick him up and bring him back home. And he didn't say anything until he got back home. And it took about, I'd say about two months to get him back down there. Wow. Two months. Did he... Did he ever end up giving you any more sense of, of what that was like? Or was it just, hey, I saw this black mass forming. I got out. That's it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It, it, it was kind of like that because, like, for him to back off from investigating and stuff like that, I think it, it took a lot for him to say, yeah, that's too much for me too soon. So, and we respected it. So we just didn't ask him questions or anything like that. We just made made sure that his, you know, his head was on straight and, you know, whenever he could get over it and, you know, he was always ready to go whenever, whenever he was ready to go. Hey, I got a new podcast coming. It's called Theory. Don't you know? This is Theo Rossi. Our world is changing. For many of us, it'll never feel the same. The important thing to remember is that we are all in this together. And that's some of what I want to talk about on my new show, Theory. We're going to discuss the things that no one ever does. The real talk, the sacrifice, and the struggle that everyone goes through. My life has kind of put me in a unique position to see things honestly. This is Theo Rossi, and my new show, Theory, launches on April 8th, officially on Spotify, Podcast One, and Apple Podcasts. Remember, folks, if you want access to this house and be a part of this unprecedented new experiment in terror and paranormal investigating, then go visit thedarkzone.tv, T-H-E-D-A-R-K-Z-O-N-E dot TV. May 8th, there's a free preview, and the subscription broadcast begins on May 9th, ending on May 16th. 
Uh, the pre-sales will be starting tomorrow, and you can buy access at thedarkzone.tv. Uh, again, much of the proceeds from this are going to be donated to various COVID-19 charities. Uh, Corey, can you tell us, um, when we say people are going to have access, explain to them just what kind of access. Is every room wired and videoed and ready to go? Uh, we're going to... We're going to have four uh, static cameras uh, going at all times, and then we're going to have like uh, a streaming camera, uh, like a cell phone streaming camera where we can interact with everybody and walk around and, you know, conduct uh, experiments, ghost box sessions, Ouija board seances, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the crowd wants, we're going to try to, you know, try to give to them. Now, I know that the ears of the millions just perked up when you said Ouija board sessions. What is your take on Ouija boards, especially in a house this active? Me, personally, I I believe there's no difference between a Ouija board and a spirit box. Um, You're opening up a line of communication. Now, granted that you're the conduit when it comes to Ouija board. But as long as you know how to open and close sessions properly, I've never had an issue. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I know myself, like, I'm confident in my abilities and, you know, but can something go wrong? Absolutely. I mean, that's a risk that we do take, but I just, I've always respected it and, you know, never had a problem with it. Jennifer, what what are your thoughts on introducing a Ouija board into your home and doing these type of investigations, especially, I mean, there's one thing when, you know, it's, it's your family pod that's doing there, uh, doing that in there in, in your home. But now knowing that you're going to have the intentions of, you know, thousands and possibly tens of thousands of people focused on and watching it as well. Does that give you any pause for concern? makes me a little nervous, I suppose, but I agree with Corey. I've, I've seen him use the Ouija board before. I personally, myself, I don't use it. I don't know how, and I would never try and pretend like, like I know how, and I know what I'm doing because I don't, but I trust him and I, I trust that he knows what he's doing. So I, all I'm right. Be fine. <laughs> well, listen, oh, that was that resoundingly secure. I think it'll be fine. <laughs> I think it'll be fine. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it'll be fine. Yeah, it's going to be fine, right, Dave? Tell me. It's <laughs> if not, uh, the cameras will be rolling, and at least we'll have proof that I, you know, strangled Corey because he was <laughs> probably being mouthy. I don't know. <laughs> Corey, you've got to worry about that possession thing, man. I, I understand. I know. I, I understand that uh, your wife is a slight uh, woman, but you know when when the demon's in you, son, the world's her oyster. You got to be careful. <laughs> now, Trust me, we have plenty of people back home that are always checking in on me. They some of them even give me a password that I need to give back to them because <laughs> they <laughs> they think that means I'm not possessed if I remember the password. So, oh, is that what it is? Okay, well, that, <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. Um, what do you, uh, you know, maybe for our audience's sake, you could catch us up a little bit and give us some of the background. Uh, and I don't know which one of you is more, um, up on the history of the house, but, and I'm not just talking about the parents. I, I, what, what do we know about this property and about this house and why it might be so unbelievably haunted? Well, the, the history of the house, um, actually, um, starts with John Smith uh, from uh, Plymouth Plantation, um, the one that married Pocahontas. He, uh, he actually came to the, to the area that we, we live in and uh, purchased land. F- uh, uh, God, what's his name? What's the name of that? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> yeah. Roger Williams. Roger Williams, yeah. But uh, Roger Williams, uh, uh, Roger Williams then deeded land to um, the Arnold family back in 1680, and they had a little over 200 acres, and they started building, you know, the foundations and stuff like that. And throughout the years, 
Um, they kept building and building onto it. Um, the King Philip's war happened and there was a lot of bloodshed in that area. You know, you had the tribes, uh, native American tribes, uh, feuding with each other, feuding with the French and the British. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the ground is just like saturated with, you know, it's stigmatized, you know, and, um, what else? We sit now, on there, a huge dog. I was going to say, there's a, a photograph of the house that has, you know, the house in the background and people kind of standing around and, and a few of them are wearing what looks to be like surgical masks. Do we, do we understand anything about that or, you know, what was taking place on the property at some point? Was it used as a makeshift hospital or morgue? Not, not that we're aware of. Um, I know that there were people that had died of, uh, was it typhoid? I believe it was typhoid and, uh, they could have been wearing masks, you know, just to stay away from that. Um, but you know, a lot of people say that one picture with the girl in the foreground with the surgical mask is Bathsheba Sherman, but there's nothing to prove that was her. She did live in the area, but she never lived in that house. Well, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Because obviously you said at the beginning, you know, you want to know when you're seeing these movies, what's real and what's not. Um, introduce us, if you would, to Bathsheba Sherman so people know more about this and, and who she was and her ties to the historical records and the fiction of the history. Okay. So the the story, the way the Conjuring movie portrayed Bathsheba Sherman was a witch that made a pact with the devil and sacrificed her, ch- her child, you know, to curse the ground that, you know, the people were living on and and so on and so forth. And the Warrens come in and discover that's who it is. And, you know, they banish her. But in, re- in reality, she was just a normal person that was married, had three children. Two of them died at a young age of uh, typhoid. And um, there's no record of her being arrested for murder. So there's no record of of her being tried for being a witch. She's buried in a consecrated ground right down the road in, in one of the local cemeteries. So, you know, the whole witchcraft thing, you know, it just doesn't fit, you know, but at the same time, it's like, you know, Lorraine Warren, you know, came in and, and gave that name. That's who it is. And it's like, you know, we can only go off the facts that we can prove, you know, this is our paperwork. I'm not a psychic. I don't know. You know, we've been getting a lot of stuff that says this, Shiva, but I just think it's kind of, I, I believe it's psychokinetic. Like so many people go in, investigate in the house, looking for Bathsheba Sherman. Some spirits just like, screw it. I'll be Bathsheba. Yeah. You're talking about Bathsheba, you know? And it's like, you know, people are giving us this evidence and it's like, yeah, you can hear the name Bathsheba, but it, it, I don't think it's, I don't think it's her, but. Which again, it's hard to say because we just can't find the proof of it. There's nothing, records back then are not like the records they keep now. So we just can't, if we can't find record proving that Bathsheba was tried as a witch. We can't call it fact because we can't find records of it. So is it just one of those things that they didn't keep records of? We don't know. Well, let's, uh, okay, so we're we're kind of examining the the history that we do know of what deaths, if any, were actually associated with this property. Uh, The only deaths that we are able to, like, like have tangible evidence, like we have, like, the paperwork to to back it up, Uh, Jeff Jeff Belanger actually was the one that brought it to us. He, um, there was uh, two deaths out on the property from exposure, um, drinking, and then they just passed out in a snowbank and ended up dying of exposure. And then there was, uh, they listed it as a suicide, but it was a younger, it was, I think it was 12 years old, um, drank uh, horse liniment. And then he crawled into a crawl space in in the, in the, in the main house and, and died, but they have it listed as a suicide, which is very strange. Um, as far as like the hanging and stuff like that, there are stories of that, but there's no hard proof of it. Um, 
the Black Book of Burrowville. We've looked through that numerous times. And where the Arnold family had like the most amount of land, sometimes I think what people were confusing was if they didn't have the Black Book of Burrowville was just a list of like all the macabre suicides, murders and stuff like that. But if they didn't have like a general area or a, a location, specific location that a person died, they associated it with the property for some reason. And I think that's where we get a lot of the, you know, inconsistencies and stuff like that. Let's do this. We have to take a quick break. We'll come back. We've got more to discuss when we talk about the Conjuring House, the hauntings. And uh, we are speaking with the owners of that house, two investigators who are committed to digging and trying to find the truth and uh, documenting this entire story, not only for themselves, but now making it available for the first time through a live streaming event that will be taking place May 9th through May 16th. Tickets again for this go on sale. You can watch online, get your streaming tickets at thedarkzone.tv. Stay tuned. We've got more right after this. You know, we all need a break now and then. I know when you're in quarantine and you're sitting there, especially self-quarantine, you're sitting there with the family. They're all getting on your nerves. You need to just get away. What do you do? You only have so much house. Well, I got something for you. And you can keep your brain active at the same time. It's called Best Fiends. Have you been playing? You know, I got hit up on social media today by uh, by a friend of mine on social media who listens to this very show who said, you know what, Tim? I passed you. Pass me on Best Fiends. Now you've motivated me. Now you've challenged me. Because you know what? Now I'm going to pass you. It's true. You can get on social media too and pass me on Best Fiends. I love Best Fiends. You guys are throwing challenges at me now. I love it. Best Fiends. Are you playing this game? You should be. It's a fun puzzle game that also has fun characters. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you too can now go check it out. It's real easy. You just go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Download it for free. It's fun. It's challenging. And best of all, you can put it down or pick it up whenever you want. What's really great as well about Best Fiends is that there's a different challenge every month. They are always changing the game when it comes to Best Fiends. It never gets stagnant. It never gets old. It's always great to sit down and play Best Fiends because they're always throwing something new at you. I got to tell you how much I love Best Fiends. One of the great things I love about Best Fiends is... I don't have to have the internet to play it. I don't have to be hooked up to Wi-Fi. I don't have to be hooked up to data plans. I can sit there and I can play it without having to be hooked up to anything. Then when I get hooked up to Wi-Fi or a data plan on my device, I can hook up to social media and I can compare and contrast with the buddies that I have online and I can tell them, hey, I just passed you at this level. I just passed you at this level. I can play along with Dave. I can play along with Winnie. I can play along with any of you guys because that's how Best Fiends works. So I'm going to challenge you guys. Get on Best Fiends. Start playing along with me. Collect those cute little characters. Defeat those slugs. And also challenge your brain with those puzzles. And let's get together and let's play some Best Fiends this week. What do you say? Let's get out of those doldrums of the self-quarantining and you know, the pandemic and all that other stuff. And let's get together and play some Best Fiends this week. What do you say? Sounds like a good idea. Best Fiends is a unique and exciting puzzle experience. Unlike all of those puzzle games out there, the game has new levels and events every month. It never gets old. And it's just one of those games that challenges you in different ways and not only keeps your motor skills going, but challenges the brain as well. And you'll be amazed at how addicting it is, how fun it is, and you're not going to want to put it down once you get started. It's real easy how to get Best Fiends. Again, you just go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store and download it for free. What am I talking about? I'm talking about Best Fiends. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends.
All right. Now, we do have our Voices from Beyond voicemail where we encourage you, the listeners, to call in and share your stories. We want to hear your actual encounters with the strange and the supernatural. Uh, you know, we've got some that are really interesting, Tim, that um, they don't want to call in the number, but they're recording their story and emailing us the MP3 of the story. We'll do that as well. Sure. That's pretty cool. So you can write your story and send it in to me. You can call our Voices from Beyond voicemail at 651-300-4977 and leave a voicemail. Uh, 651-300-4977 and leave us your story. Or you can record your story and email that story to me at daviddarknessradio.com. Why don't we do that right now, Tim? We've got a Skinwalker Ranch story that one of the listeners has uh, sent in to us. Let's take a listen. Hey, Dave. Hey, Tim. Uh, real big fan of the podcast. I actually called earlier in the year to report uh, a line of UFOs that I thought turned out to be satellites <laughs> or the um, uh, the internet satellite thing, I guess. I can't remember exactly what it was. But I thought I'd call back uh, with a couple more stories. So I actually lived um, or I actually grew up about – maybe less than a mile or two actually away from the Skinwalker Ranch. Now, I haven't watched the uh, Skinwalker Ranch episodes from uh, History Channel yet. It's on my to-do list, and I know you're asking, what am I doing here not listening to it when I could be watching it? So uh, bear in mind, I'm still, <laughs> still going to be watching it here soon. But I thought I'd kind of call in with some stories about about where I live. And where I, you know, it's it's funny that I I lived there for so long that I didn't even really know anything about it until the book and my mom. Um, but growing up, it wasn't ever really a big thing that was ever really talked about in our community. Um, I don't know if it was just lack of uh, coverage on it or just nobody wanted to talk about it. But but again, it's it's kind of been a fairly new thing within our community. As far as I know, growing up, it was never something that we even really uh, knew about. Anyway, I thought I'd call in with a couple of my stories. I've actually worked in the oil field. Now, there's an oil field that um, is pretty close to the Skinwalker Ranch, and I've worked in that oil field for about six years. And some of the uh, some of the strangest things that I've ever encountered have actually happened close to that area or in that oil field. Uh, one night, I was uh, hauling uh, production water. I'm a diesel uh, uh, driver, diesel truck driver, and while I was hauling water. <clears throat> I actually came upon um, these two tanks, and it was nighttime, so I had all my lights on and everything. And when I was going to go and uh, work around that tank, I noticed something. I, I could see the lights behind this tank and the shadows in between. And when I looked close, I could see something really big and tall. And it, this figure was completely dark, and I could not see through it. But it was lingering in between the shadows of both tanks. And I just remember seeing it and I, and I completely froze. Like I couldn't even move because I was so, I was so scared. And I stared at this thing for about five seconds. And once I got my bearings underneath me, I was able to walk away from it. Um, I went about my business. I finished uh, my job and I had to, I actually had to walk closer to this tank in order to finish my work. And I remember walking up to it. And this thing just was standing there. Now, this thing had a silhouette. It had to be about, I'd say, about nine feet tall. But it just, a rush of fear just hit me. And I knew something was standing there watching me. So as I finished my job, I walked back to go deliver um, my tickets uh, into the mailbox on there on the location. And as I walked past it, the... The, the dark figure was gone and I was completely dumbfounded as to what it could have been. And as I looked closer, um, you could see tracks in the snow leading away from wherever that thing was standing. So, <laughs> um, I, I got in my truck and I, and I hightailed it out of there. I've never been that scared, um, working on the oil field in my life. <laughs> Uh, another story happened um, a little bit closer to actually that uh, that area. Um, I remember sitting uh, sitting there waiting uh, to do my job, and I was looking out of my window. And as I was looking, it was a really foggy night. Now, keep in mind the the best time to catch anything like that is usually on a foggy night, especially 
close to that ranch, I guess, if you if you want to connect it to that. But I remember seeing some really weird things during foggy nights. Um, I was sitting there uh, waiting, and as I was looking up, you could see a break in the sky, you know, break in the fog in the sky. And I looked up, and I was looking at the moon and didn't think too much of it. And I was just staring at the moon. And all of a sudden, that light from the moon split into two. And then it split into three, and this thing started just going in a circle, and it looked really odd to me. And as I was staring at it, like it just, like I said, it just kept moving in circles. And as I was going to get out of my truck to look further, the cloud cover had come over and actually just covered up whatever I was looking at. Um, earlier in that night, I was driving um, past the hillside. Now I've been up and down this hillside a bunch of times, and. I've never seen any th any sort of lights or anything, but as I come down this hillside, my headlights reflected off of something off that off this hill. Again, I've been up and down that hill for months, night you know, lights, brights, everything, and nothing. I've never seen a light refraction like this, and it looked almost like it had bounced off of like a personal mirror or something. And the whole night, I kept going up and down that hill, and I never saw it again. So. Whatever I ran in, whatever my headlights hit, it bounced off. I, I guess that I can't explain it. Those are my uh, few encounters as far as the oil field goes. Um, I have a few friends that have some stories, but uh, I'll definitely give you guys a holler back. And hopefully you guys enjoy these stories, and uh, I'll call back with more. Thanks, guys. Bye. Excellent. I like it. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Again, if you guys want to do that, record your own story and email it to us, Dave at darknessradio.com. We'll play it on an upcoming episode. Or call into our voices from Beyond Voicemail, 651 300 4977. Make Tim work for his dollar. If you record in and leave four, <laughs> five, six messages, he's got to edit them all together and uh, you make him work for it. But we want to hear from you either way. Or you can always just email in your stories to us because you're too lazy to call. Whatever, it works fine either way. We appreciate it. All right, Tim. Let's get started with some supernatural news. What have you got uh, Got to start us off with this week? Make me work for my dollar. Uh, well, we, yeah. were, uh, we were talking with the owners of the Conjuring House about uh, their quarantine and haunted surroundings. Uh, this next story has to do with a man who's forced to quarantine in a ghost town with a gruesome past, Dave. Um, some of us don't have it so easy in quarantine. I feel like I have it pretty easy after reading this story. All right. All yeah. right. What have we yeah. got? Uh, well, uh, Brent Underwood learned a tough lesson. You don't spend millions on a ghost town in which you wouldn't want to self-isolate. Uh, the 32-year-old marketer took sheltering in place to the next level when he became trapped in a California ghost town he recently purchased. The problem is there's no running water and a snowstorm has him trapped. Plus, it may be haunted. So there, there you go. It's just small problems, oh, Dave. It's just piling up, though. Little itty-bitty problems that one by one wouldn't seem so bad, but suddenly you find yourself thrust into The Shining. Yeah. You're cut off from the rest of the world in the middle of a blizzard in a haunted location. Little problems. Just tiny little itty-bitty problems. Uh, when I first got there, he says, I was in a t-shirt and enjoying myself, Underwood tells the Post, and then it snowed for four days straight, and now there's no way to get out. He bought Cerro Gordo, a former silver mining town with a murderous history, for $1.4 million in 2018. Aside from monthly visits, Underwood has largely left it in the care of, his, of its uh, full-time live-in caretaker of 21 years, Robert Desmarais. Uh, when the scope of the coronavirus pandemic became clear, Underwood agreed to take over duties for a week. Well, Desmarais checked in on his wife in Arizona, but that was about a month ago. Now he's stuck in his ghost town under five feet of snow. Piece of cake. Man, That's all? Imagine having to plow all that. I Just, refuse to. I'm not going to imagine it. You can't force me to. That, uh, you know, we, we complain when we get six inches of snow around here. Imagine five feet and then having to plow all that. That's... That's not yeah. good. Uh, I think I'll pass. Uh, he goes on to say, in the absolute worst case scenario, there's snowshoes here, and the road is seven miles long down a steep hill. Yikes. Uh, but that will only get him to a 35-person town without grocery stores. And he's found himself out of breath after snowshoeing for just several yards. 
The closest town with a grocery store, Dave, is 26 miles away. <laughs> Holy Christmas! Yeah. Yeah, that's that's just to get provisions. Uh, he's been melting snow for water, and while he's out of bread and vegetables, he has enough rice and canned tuna to get him through until the snow thaws. Ew. I love white rice and I love tuna and the mixture. I'd do it. I'd be okay with that. Oh, I, no, I'd go nuts. Ugh. I'd I'd just as soon go outside hunting rabbits. I love me some rabbits. You know what I do love though, Tim. What's that? Got to tell you, I've, I've going crazy for these. You know, during during this, I have been able to reinvigorate my life with the take home uh, White Castles you can get at oh. grocery stores. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, holy God, are these good? These are. You know what? I've I've learned an important lesson, Tim. What's that? It doesn't have to be late night. I don't have to have been out drinking with friends to enjoy White Castle. No, the sliders are amazing. God, they're unbelievably delicious. Mm-hmm. If you guys haven't tried it yet, next time you're out and and making a quarantine run, go to your frozen food aisles. They have sliders. And I thought, oh, microwavable sliders? I don't know. Is that going to... Holy God, they're delicious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're really good, folks. So go check that out. That's just another little tip from your buddies Dave and Tim here at uh, at uh, Darkness Radio. They had NAMI. Okay. But uh, they're really yeah. good. I just, you know, since we're talking food, I thought I'd throw that in again. I, 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 I devoured, I got to tell you, Shay ate an entire box of six the other day, Tim. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's no shame in it, I guess. I just I, enjoyed it. But, you know, they're good. You eat them, well worth it. It was a great little binge. I've got uh, literally a quarter of my freezer is packed with these boxes. I like to and, have them for lunch while I'm editing the show. Oh, see, yeah. perfect. Yeah, little bite-sized foods, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, I digress. There's anyway, not- I, I, you could tell I'm hungry while we're recording this because uh, my mouth is salivating at the concept that as soon as I as soon as I disconnect with you uh, on today's show, I'm going to go down and eat some more White Castle. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with. That. In fact, I think I'm going to have some too for lunch because uh, I I absolutely have gotten into that lately. I'm I I was going to mention that as well too. The the sliders with from White Castle in the frozen section, amazing. I. I've gotten uh, I've gotten into it lately, and actually, I had a couple people uh, hit me up on social media and left pi- uh, pictures of the packages that they picked up this uh, this past week as well. So yeah, it, it uh, I'm telling you, and, it's, and and the way I do it, I get the I get the ones with cheese, and then I put a little mustard yep. and a little pickle on it, little dill, dill pickle slices. Exactly, yep. that's that's what I've been doing. Yep. But I include ketchup because I'm not an animal. I like ketchup, wow. mustard, and a pickle, Tim. So, wow. And that's just the difference between us. You and I live in different lives. I, you know, I'm on TV, so I get the ketchup. Yeah, ketchup is for the uncivilized. I'm just saying, you never see <laughs> ketchup at a fine steakhouse. You'll, you'll never yeah, see you're it. actually incorrect. <clears throat> they do have ketchup at most fine steakhouses. Yeah, they so. keep it in the back near the garbage. Uh, you they have to go out to the aisle. Or to, they have to go out to the alley to find it. Oh, I don't think uh, we could be friends <clears throat> anymore. All right, Tim. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we were talking yeah. about uh, we were talking about our friend uh, out at uh, out there in uh, the uh, ghost town. So he has to go twenty six miles to find groceries. Uh, he's living on white rice and canned tuna. Ugh, ugh, ugh. That sounds like a, a wrestler diet: white rice and canned tuna, um, melting snow for water. He's out of bread and vegetables. He remains uh-huh. in good spirits for now, but a different type of spirit is giving him trouble, Dave, while he's in that ghost town. Underwood says he was aware of the 22 building town's violent reputation when he bought it, adding that it had once had one murder per week. Yikes. A TV wow. show called Ghost Adventures. Never heard of it. Uh, once investigated ghost, the town. Uh, well, what? Ghost aben- uh, Adventures? Adventures. Uh, adven- ghost Adventures, Dave. Ghost uh, Adventures. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Never heard of it. Um, uh, once ad- investigated the town and found that it was haunted by the ghosts of two children who died after being trapped in a closet. Uh, I stay in the room with the child ghosts, says Underwood, but I have yet to see them. Uh, but that doesn't mean spooky things aren't happening in Cerro Gordo uh, during the lockdown. Things are moving around. I'm seeing curtains move. I'm hearing things in the night, he says. There's no draft, but things drop inside of houses. 
In addition to a general ambiance of otherworldliness, a light in the bunkhouse keeps turning on, and his wallet recently disappeared for two days, only to reappear in the town hotel. That was a bit freaky, he admits, but he believes the spirits are peaceful. For the most part, I leave the ghosts alone, and they leave me alone, Underwood says. I try to respect their space. Anytime you're in a town and expect to see nothing and hear nothing, when you do, your mind is on heightened alert, he adds. Despite all the jitters, Underwood finds the town beautiful, and the prospect of returning to society is not wholly appealing. If I don't look at my phone or my computer, it's like nothing happened, he says. When I do look at the news and I see how chaotic and terrible things are, there's a part of me that isn't in a huge rush to re-enter the world. He also takes strength from the town's history, knowing it's weathered similar storms. It's been through pl- er, many pandemics, including Spanish influenza, he says, and it's still standing. Underwood is passing the time fixing up and finding artifacts on the property, going on hikes and remotely managing his five employees in Austin, Texas, via satellite internet, occasionally consulting with a pair of crows, uh, DeMarie named Heckle and Jekyll. So he actually talks to a pair of crows, Dave. That'll keep your sanity intact. Um, Yeah, yeah, well. if, If I'm working through something at work, I'll tell... Jekyll about it, he says. I think I talk to myself through talking to the animals. Well, way to go there, Dr. Doolittle. Uh, he plans to return to Austin to quarantine when he's able to, uh, but in the meantime, he feels as though he's done a proper job of secluding himself from humanity and the virus currently wreaking havoc on it. Uh, as the world is trying to isolate themselves, there's not much further isolation you can do than an abandoned ghost town, he says. I'm trying to embrace it. What if Heckle and Jekyll get the coronavirus and bring it right to his doorstep? That's my question. I no, that'd be more like the bird flu, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Well, the birds do fly, Dave. They they come in and out of town with the coronavirus and give it to give it to. The Is that guy. how it works? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. To this we have to look at the math, and I need a diagram and a flow chart. So is there? So has he dealt with anything paranormal, really, or is this just him bitching and whining that he has to? He's wealthy enough to buy an entire town, and now he's got to live in it. Well, he's saying these child ghosts are 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 kind of playing with him, and that he's things are moving, and his wallet disappeared and ended up in the town hotel. Well, that's something, I guess. Yeah. 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 Sounds like the makings of a reality TV show or a new Stephen King book, though. <laughs> It could be. All right. Uh, where are we off to next? Or is there more to the story? There's no more to that story, but let's move okay. on. Uh, President Donald Trump on Wednesday uh, called footage from the Pentagon showing unidentified aerial phenomena. Do, 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 do. Uh, gave it a little lilt at the end there again. That a is, tip, yeah. a, a little bit of a change. I like to give a screwball in there, Tim. I, uh, well, you said it. I didn't. Um, uh, he called that uh, a hell of a video and told Reuters he wonders if it's real, the video, not anything mm. else. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't think that uh, that says he's open to too much as far as disclosure goes himself. Uh, earlier this week, the Pentagon officially released three videos that show what appear to be unidentified flying objects rapidly moving while recorded by infrared cameras. Two of the videos contain service members reacting in awe at how quickly the objects are moving. One voice speculates that it could be a drone. I just wonder if it's real, Trump said of the videos. That's a hell of a video, is the other part of the quote. Uh, The Navy had acknowledged the veracity of the videos, which had been previously released by a private company in September. They officially released them this week in order to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage has been that had been circulating was real or whether or not there is more to the videos, according to Pentagon spokesperson Sue, Sue Gao. Uh, in 2017, one of the pilots who saw one of the unidentified objects in 2004 told CNN that it moved in ways he couldn't explain. As I got close to it, it rapidly accelerated to the south and disappeared in less than two seconds, said retired U.S. Navy pilot David Fravor. Uh, Trump, who has often spread conspiracy theories, is skeptical of UFOs. 
In an interview with ABC News last year, the president said he'd had a meeting on the subject, but that he's skeptical the fast-moving objects are anything extraterrestrial. I did have one very brief meeting on it, he said in an interview, but people are saying that they're seeing UFOs. Do I believe it? Not particularly. Uh, The government has been quietly studying the possibility of UFOs for decades, with the Pentagon previously studying recordings of aerial encounters with unknown objects as part of a since-shuttered classified program that was launched at the behest of former Senator Harry Reid of Nevada. The program was launched in 2007 and ended in 2012, according to the Pentagon, because they assessed that there were higher priorities that needed funding. Um, so I don't know. The president not really believing that what was on that video was necessarily of another planet. Yeah, I, I get that aspect of it, but I don't know. They all seem so freaked out, right? Mm-hmm. They all seem so freaked out by that video themselves and the fact that the, you know, I guess there's something. If the Pentagon's releasing it, you know, or are they just choosing right now to kind of open the disclosure even more? I don't know. You know, it was interesting uh, when um, it, there was a hashtag that was going around uh, going around Twitter. Um, I think the hashtag was aliens are real after the, those uh, videos were released. And so our friend uh, Santana from the Inner Circle at All Elite Wrestling, who was on the Jericho cruise with us and part of the alien intention experiment, um, (laughs) he tweeted out, woke up, saw the hashtag aliens are real. Uh, I'm trying to remember the rest of the uh, the rest of the tweet kind of shook my head, went back to bed. And so I responded back to him and I said, uh, but you already knew that aliens were real with a little winky face. And then the hashtag things you see on the Jericho cruise. (laughs) (laughs) That's cool. So I kind of, I I want to throw this at you. My 2020 predictions this year. Mm -hmm. uh, One of them, as a matter of fact, my number four was that the Academy to the stars releases major news this year that will grab the attention of the world. This Pentagon news is coming out because of the released footage from the Academy to the stars. Very true. So I'm, I'm just saying, I got one. I think I got one. Well, how about this? Kirk Douglas passes away in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah. So that's two out of the 10 that I made, Tim. And huh. my 10th prediction, I predict only three of my predictions will come true. So the 10th is right so far, which makes one. Kirk Douglas, two, Academy of the Stars, three. So far, I'm I'm on. I'm on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but wait a minute. Okay, so if only three of your predictions come right, and then your prediction was only three of your predictions came right, that would be four out of ten, meaning that you just trumped No, 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 yourself? but so far I've only got two right, plus the tenth one saying that three of my predictions will come true. The 10th one being the third prediction that only three will come true. The third, the 10th one is a prediction. Boy, that's in itself. That's barely squeaking it over the goal line right there. My oh, friend. Dare you. <laughs> well, I lost Ravens with the 2020 Super Bowl. That's not it. Now here's an interesting one. Uh-huh. North Korea crosses a big line that leads to severe fallout mid spring to mid summer. And now there's quite a bit going on with the old Kim bum blue, whatever his name is. Kim Jong Chung Lu. What the hell is his name? Kim, Kim Chung. What? I can't. I really can't say it. And my, Kim Wang Chung. My mind. Um, yeah, Wang Chung. It's um. It's Kim Jong Un. That's it. Right. I, you know what's weird is I could see it in my head. None of those words would come out of my mouth. But uh, the the fact that he may or may not have died recently could lead to something. We'll have to see how that plays out. Well, now if he's if he's dead, the the rumor is the sister takes over. Right. Yeah. And and she's a little more militant than he is, which I'm just saying, you know, if, if that happens, we're all in trouble because the fallout mid spring to mid summer. That was my uh, my my quote. The talk is if she takes over, then the the nuclear tests continue, which isn't you necessarily that they a cross thing. a big line. Huh? No, 
Who knows? I might, I might end up with four, but then then we have to be really careful because then my tenth prediction continues to say I predict only three of my predictions will come true. Yeah. And if I get more right, I should be treated as a wish a witch and crushed under the world's biggest McRib sandwich, Tim. Boy. And uh-huh. with a food shortage, a meat shortage, uh, you know, where are we going to find all the yoga mats to make that? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm willing to look for them. That's I'm true. starting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, let's uh, let's go back on. What other news uh, stories do we have to share? Well, Dave, uh, if you're looking for something to read while you're in quarantine, uh, evidently a Scottish witchcraft book has been published online. So you just uh, yes, yeah. my heritage, my Scottish heritage is coming forth with a witchcraft book that you can now all read. Just like that, it's uh, you, are you going to do the audio book? Oh, maybe I should. <laughs> How would that be? Because he really can't. Mike Myers is overdone, right? I mean, he's he's yeah, yeah, he, yeah. You just can't have Mike Myers constantly being the Scottish voice, although. I admit that I sound a lot like a bad impersonation of Mike Myers. Could be. So either way, yeah. it's a lose-lose situation. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, the pages of a 350-year-old book used to record the names of those accused of witchcraft in Scotland have been published online. That could be kind of boring if you're just reading names. I'm not going to lie. Unless there's the Schrader family showing up in there. Oh, God. The Clarks. The Clarks. That's my biological dad. It may be all Clarks, the way you guys reproduce. Just it's true. Uh, yeah. uh, the Names of Witches in Scotland 1658 collection was drawn up during a time where the persecution of supposed witches was right, rife, rife. I can't tell the difference between the F and the T. I may have to go back for new bifocals. I'm just saying. Uh, the book also lists the towns where the accused lived and notes of confession. It is believed many were healers practicing traditional folk medicine. Some of the notes give small insights into the lives of those accused. It is recorded that the spouse of Agnes Watson from Dumbarton is deceased. I don't know how to pronounce that name. It's um, Umkuhile, I believe. Uh, A majority of those accused of witchcraft were women, although the records reveal that some men were also persecuted. John Gilchrist and Robert Semple from Dumbarton uh, are recorded as sailors. A uh, James Lerile of uh, Alloway Iyer is noted as clanged, in other words, cleaned or made clean. While Mr. Lerile's fate is unclear, the term probably meant banishment or death. The passing of the Scottish Witchcraft Act of uh, 1563 made witchcraft or consulting with witches capital crimes in Scotland. Uh, It is estimated that between 3,000 and 5,000 women were publicly accused of being witches in 16th and 17th century Scotland, a much higher number than in England. The outbreak of witch hunting in the years 1658 and 1662, the period in which the list of names was created, is generally seen to represent the high watermark of persecution of accused witches in Scotland. In many cases, the victims were healers, part of a tradition of folk medicine. Their treatments sometimes help poor communities, but accusations of witchcraft could crop up if they did not work. The book has been published by the genealogy firm Ancestry, digitized from original records held by the Welcome Library. Miriam Silverman, Ancestry uh, senior content manager said many of us have donned a black dress, pointy hat, and even green face paint to go to Halloween parties as witches, but that's our almost comic interpretation of something mysterious and scary that people feared in the past. In the 17th century, people believed that the unholy forces of witchcraft were lurking in their communities, and those accused of being witches were persecuted on the basis of those dark suspicions. Whether your ancestors were accused witches or not, uh, you can find out more about them and their lives by searching these and many other collections online today. So there you go. Very cool. Where are we off to next, sir? Uh, next, it turns out that Ghost Hunter Steve Gonzalez has directed a new haunted house documentary called The House in Between. Uh, Robot Ninja Media presents a paranormal investigation spanning over a decade in the upcoming documentary The House in Between, 
which was produced and co-directed by Ghost Hunter and Ghost Nation star Steve Gonzalez. The paranormal investigator co-directed the film with Kendall Welpton, and it's set for digital and DVD Blu-ray release on May 5th. Uh, The documentary tells the story of Alice Jackson, who has refused to spend another night in her own home after a life-changing paranormal experience. Looking for answers, she opened her house up to investigators and allowed them to conduct the first ever decade-long paranormal investigation. Who or what is haunting Alice's home? You can find out coming up on May 5th. The official press details for the documentary tease, the film is not only scary, but it's also a thought-provoking look at what it's like to live with a haunting Bridging the Paranormal, Real Science, and Human Experience. This documentary shows a detailed look at what could be the most haunted house in America. Uh, There's also some official trailers that are out there if you want to go take a look on YouTube as well. Again, the movie is called The House in Between, and it is being released on May 5th. Let's uh, let's take a call. We got our Beyond uh, Voices from Beyond voicemail. Uh, we have a caller who who decided to share a story, and it's just that simple: six five one three zero zero four nine seven seven. How about you give a little bit back, folks? Call in and share a story with us: six five one three zero zero four nine seven seven. Just like this caller. Hello, Dave, Tim. This is Natasha from Michigan. I spoke to my mom a week ago and uh she kind of encouraged me to share a story with you guys um so when i was about six or seven my family lived in a duplex home um we called it the duplex on fourth street as a child i would see two kids scooting on their butts kind of down the stairs like some kids do playing um and when i would put my foot on the stairs they would just seem to vanish And my older brother at one point had told me of a blonde woman that he would see next to my bed watching me sleep. Now, as a kid at the time, this this scared me, and I would sleep with my blankets pulled over my head. Um, And I remember seeing a boy, I would only see him outside, who seemed older than my brothers and I, and I would remember drawing circles in the dirt when he was around and I referred to him as Jacob and he made me feel calm during bad times that would take place in this duplex. Now the part of the story that made my hair stand on Ed was a call that I got from my mom about a week ago. So I missed her call because I was doing my cleaning job. It was late night in a warehouse office type building So I gave her a call back and I let her know that I was listening to a podcast. So I explained uh, Beyond the Darkness to her. And she kind of laughed at me asking, well, why are you listening to ghost stories when you're by yourself? And just brushed it off. And I told her that I was thinking about calling in and sharing that story with you guys. And she became very excited and... (laughs) Uh, said, oh, I have some ghost stories. So the first thing that she said was, do you remember the duplex on 4th Street? I said, yeah, that's the place that I was planning on sharing about. And we were both silent for about half a second before she spoke about her encounter. She had said that She would hear laughter coming from upstairs in our bedrooms, the sound of children playing instead of sleeping. And after the mother's count of three, one, two, three, she began to come up the stairs to scold my brothers and I for not sleeping. At the foot of the stairs, looking up, she seen two children, and they kind of scampered into the bedrooms. Uh, So she started to come upstairs. So when my mom had reached the top of the stairs, she turned to enter my room. My room was the first one at the very top of the stairs. She said when she turned and looked into the doorway, she seen a blonde-haired woman in a white gown looking over my bed. And then she said uh, that the woman had turned and looked at her and shushed her like she was being too loud. And my mom looked over and 
all three of us kids were sound asleep. So after she had explained her tale to me, and I I then explained to her what my older brother had told me about the blonde-haired woman and what I have seen uh, with the two kids on the stairs, she says, well, why didn't you guys say anything? And I'm just thinking, well, Mom, we were kids. And then she had told me that she had talked to the lady who lived on the other side of the duplex from us. Um, if any odd things have ever happened on that side of the house. And the lady said no. But then my mom was told that there was a family who used to live there, a woman, her husband, the woman's mother, and then the three kids. And she had, the neighbor lady had told my mom that the father of the family had murdered the three kids, the woman, and her mother. Now, I don't know if any of those accounts of the murder are true or not, but I do know that I did get goosebumps when my mom's encounters matched that of mine and my brother's, and to my knowledge, neither of us have ever shared our stories with each other. So that's uh, my story about the 4th Street house. Thank you guys for listening, and stay safe. And on a side note, Tim, I just wanted to reassure you, I guess, in a way that artificial intelligence scares me to stay safe, keep doing what you're doing, love the show, guys. Bye. All right, Timothy, where are we going next in the world of supernatural news? We're headed to Bismarck, Dave. We're, I don't know, have you ever been to any of the Space Aliens uh, franchises? Uh, yes, actually, there's one on the way up to the Palmer House I've stopped at. Yeah, they're kind of yeah. a cute little themed restaurant. and. Yes, they uh, are. Delicious little food. Yeah. And Space Aliens Grill and Bar in Bismarck is giving customers a little bit of a treat and an out-of-this-world delivery. Uh, The Bismarck restaurant is using a mascot to create some out-of-this-world encounters. It's the cutest little mascot ever if you take a look at the little guy. Actually, it's a green alien that'll scare the hell out of you if you believe in aliens visiting your house and you haven't ordered takeout or you don't know that someone in the family has uh space aliens grill and bar is known for their galactic atmosphere but since switching to takeout and delivery they're looking for ways to take that experience beyond the restaurant the alien or the resident alien roswell has been going out that's their mascot has been going out on deliveries to bring some joy to the customers stuck inside during this pandemic i just think that having the space alien and that it's so fun and free-spirited and getting to share that with the community right now is pretty important. Right now, people are feeling closed in, hemmed in, and, you know, the four walls is all they have to look at. And so when that alien shows up and just adds a little bit of fun, shared the <laughs> shared Sheila Glazer, the COO of Space Aliens. That's the whole quote there, Dave. It's kind of discombobulated, but hey, why not? Uh, If you call ahead when you're in Bismarck and let them know you have someone in your house with a birthday, Roswell shows up and makes the delivery. And uh, let's just say it's it's quite uh, it's either quite cute or uh, quite the traumatic experience, depending on how you feel about aliens. So there you go. But overall, they're doing something important, Tim. Yeah, they're trying to bring a little joy to the world. Ah, All the boys and girls now. Ha! Joy to the fishes in a deep blue sea. Come on, Tim. Joy to you and me. Ah. But what if you're an abductee, Dave, and you decide Joy to, to them send... Joy to too, Tim. Joy to them. What, and, and you decide to send takeout to an abductee. <laughs> I'm just thinking that's the ultimate uh, practical joke gone wrong. You know... Well, that's that, yeah. Uh, yeah that I mean, it, negative. it yeah. could be used for evil, Dave. It could be used for evil. You know, uh, there's the half glass full people, then there's the half glass empty people. Tim, you're kind of falling in that latter category right now. I don't see it as half glass empty, Dave. I see it as quite hysterical. (laughs) All right, where are we off to next? I'd want to send Roswell over to the Skinwalker Ranch. I think it would be funny, just for the delivery of food, just to see how the boys react. Just saying. Uh, We're going to America's UFO Welcome Center, Dave. It's over there in South Carolina, and it's a South Carolina wonder. It uh, Well, I don't know if it's a wonder. If you take a look at this thing, it kind of looks like a UFO graffiti center. I'm just saying. 
Roadside attractions might be the best part of family vacations and long road trips, Dave, but the coolest ones are the hardest to find. But once they're scoped out, they become a must-see on every trip. There's one attraction in South Carolina, though, that's not only cheap. It looks like it might have been built cheap, too. But it's one visitors will never forget. The UFO Welcome Center is located in Bowman, South Carolina. God help you if you're passing through. Uh, South Carolina native Jody Pendarvis uh, created this unique attraction, actually created this travel stop location for humans and extraterrestrials, in case either one's coming through, I guess. The largest alien spaceship has multiple levels for visitors to check out. Uh, Pendarvis began building this unique structure in 1994 with the idea of wanting it to be a location that aliens could feel comfortable when meeting people from Earth. This according to Roadside America. (laughs) I'm looking at this thing and nobody would be comfortable in this except for uh, Wandering Hobos, which is the name of my new group, (laughs) my new bluegrass group that will be touring South Carolina. Wandering hobos? Wandering hobos, yes. I like it. Can I yeah. play that uh, plucky twinger twanger thing that you put in your mouth? Yeah, bam, bam, yeah bam. the mouth harp. The mouth oh, harp. Whatever. My, I think my name was a little bit more catchy, but whatever. Okay. The plucky, plucky, plungy thing. That is twanger that, thing, yeah. Twanger thing, yeah. The plucky mm-hmm. twanger thing. I'll be playing the uh, the jugs. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> I'll be playing the jugs. You play the plucky, plucky mouth thing or whatever. Plucky twanger thing. The plucky and, uh, twanger you'll be playing the, the I'll jugs. I'll be playing the jugs, yeah. You do have, you do have some nice jugs, Tim. I've Thank seen you. Them. Well, I'll the be. The brown, brown one is my favorite. Yeah, I'll little be. brown jug, yeah. I'll be mishandling the brown jugs. Uh, the main UFO is 46 feet wide and has a bathroom, air conditioning, and even TV. Why wouldn't it? There's also a smaller UFO saucer on top that visitors can climb up to. It's made out of sturdy aluminum, Dave. <laughs> Inside is mostly scrapped metal and wires. It's good wire. Uh, when visitors first view the structure, they might think it's been abandoned or no longer operational, but that's actually the aesthetic Pendarvis was going for. Sure it was. Uh, visitors are invited to just knock on Pendarvis's door and gain entrance to explore. Knock, knock, knocking on Pendarvis' door. Ay, 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 ay. You can also Sorry, gain... Folks, it's musical threats. I can't stop myself. I, I guess not. Uh, you can knock on Pendarvis's door. Ay, ay, ay. Mm-hmm. I thought you were going for the Three's Company vibe there, but you didn't. Um, and gain, no. en- gain entrance for uh, just a dollar. To really? explore this tin shack, this thing looks like it 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 violates many health codes, and it's going to fall a, a, around your ears when you walk into it. It looks like you know how when you're a kid you build a really bad fort, and the thing falls over in about three or four days because you you don't know anything about structure. How dare you? No, I mean we all do it as kids. Yes, I know. I... This is this is like the ultimate bad UFO fort. Okay. Made, Made out of sheet metal. Uh, If travelers don't want to explore inside this extraterrestrial creation, they can simply take photos and admire from afar. I would suggest admiring from afar if you value your safety. Uh, Roadside America also explained that the creator of this sculpture loves showing off this home, whether his visitors are humans or aliens. In 2001, The Daily Show host Stephen Colbert took a tour of the attraction. He even added it as a full segment on his show. Aside from the $1 fee to tour the saucers, there's a tip jar at the entrance. If visitors feel led to give a little bit more to help Jody Pendarvis's uh, continue his alien correspondence dreams, if aliens ever come to Earth, this might be the first place they want to explore. My guess is no. I'm just saying. Could be. Yeah. But that's that's the end of that. that All right. How many more stories do we have, sir? Uh, Just the one. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, you get it. You deserve it. Our final supernatural news story of the day. But before we do that, Tim, Mm -hmm. before we take people on that little journey, I'd like to remind people that this show isn't just once a week, Tim. I don't know if you knew that. No, it's not. No, our show is is not just one day a week. Our show is multiple days, Tim. Mm -hmm. We're also on Sunday. Did you know that, Tim? Sundays. We have a little program we like to air 
uh, called Darkness Radio as well, where we go into the paranormal, Tim, looking for exciting new things to discuss and fun things to uh, explore. And uh, I'm killing time because for some reason my computer's frozen up and uh, I can't remember who our guest is uh, tomorrow. Oh, that's right. Uh, we're going to talk about quantum science with Dr. Carl Kalaman on tomorrow's show. Right. So all kinds of cool, strange. You guys want more scientific? You want more insight? Dr. Uh, Carl Kalaman is here to talk to us about that uh, tomorrow on the program. So make sure you tune in for that. And then Tuesday, a brand new True Crime Tuesday. Tim, it is the anniversary of the Kent State shootings. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be discussing that on the program on True Crime Tuesday. Uh, it's a it's a remarkable story. If you're not really familiar with it or even if you think you know it but would like to know more, make sure you check out True Crime Tuesday. You can subscribe and uh, never miss another episode or another minute in the best in True Crime Talk Radio. And remember, by supporting our True Crime Talk Radio, it also helps us uh, with this show to keep it on the air. And we've got some exciting news. Uh, now we're being told we will be able to officially mention everything around the mid part of May. So as soon as we know more, I will let you know more. So be patient. Thank you. And uh, but but go subscribe and support your buddies, Dave and Tim. We need your help. Uh, you know, keeps us floating and keeps us able to to continue to bring you these great shows Saturday and Sunday and every Tuesday with True Crime Tuesday. All right, Tim, our final story is upon us. We like to call it negotiating your nightmares. This is our uh, final story just to kind of give you the willies before we uh, we let you go. Uh, this story, Dave, uh, comes to us uh, comes to us out of uh, New York from the New York Post. A woman wakes up in a body bag after being pronounced dead by her doctor. Oh, no! Worst nightmare ever, but another stride in proving that the zombie apocalypse will happen first, Tim. I don't think so, Dave. No, I just don't. Part of that statement is correct. You don't think. Oh, oh, but you know what? I've I've had many, many stories. See, I don't turn some of these over to you. I should. I, I got stories this week about how robots are being used in this coronavirus pandemic. And I know you stay away from those on purpose, but that's okay. No, it's okay. Whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. There's just so many times you could hear about wonderful, loving robots that want to save our lives and tw try to twist it, Tim. This you can't twist. A woman was <laughs> dead. Now she's not. Boom. Zombie apocalypse. I'm just saying. I just don't think she was dead to begin with. But let's go on. I'll, I'll, I'll humor you on this one yet again. Uh, oh, sing. Uh, they were dead wrong. It says here, dead wrong. Get it, Dave? Just means the doctor was wrong. In a scene straight out of, it says here, a George Romero zombie movie, the only thing that was zombie about this article, a Paraguay mother miraculously sprang back to life in a body bag after being pronounced dead by doctors earlier that day. Gladys Rodriguez de Duarte, uh, who suffers from ovarian cancer, had been admitted to San Fernando Clinic in Coronel Ovio Oviedo, on Saturday morning, after experiencing a severe spike in blood pressure, reports local newspaper ABC Color. A mere two hours later, her treating physician, Dr. Heriberto Vera, uh, mistakenly declared the 46-year-old woman dead of cervical cancer and handed a death certificate to her husband and daughter. Undertakers transported what they presumed to be Duarte's cadaver to Duarte Hijos uh, funeral home whereupon they noticed the body moving inside the bag evidently not dead uh, the resurrected patient that's in quotes was rushed oh, to intensive resurrected back from the dead huh? that's in quotes quotes was yeah, rushed making it the most important part resurrected <laughs> was rushed to intensive care where she's currently in delicate but stable condition, according to ABC Color. Uh, needless to say, Duarte's premature death declaration, that's not in quotes, that's for sure, uh, didn't sit well with not her enraged... Not important, that's why. Huh? Not, not nearly as important, that's why. No, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's a for sure premature death declaration. <laughs> didn't sit Is well with... <laughs> no. Didn't sit well with her enraged family. Her husband, Maximo Duarte Ferreira, 
uh, has reportedly filed a complaint against the doctor claiming that the medics purposefully announced her passing because they no longer wanted to treat her. Oh, we have a reason. See? That's horrible. He assumed she was... Horrible. Yeah, it is. He assumed she was dead and handed her naked to me like an animal with her death certificate, fumed Ferreira, to local media. He claims that they disconnected her and passed her off to the funeral home without even trying to revive her. However, doctors deny any foul play. He tried to revive her, but it was unsuccessful, says fellow physician Dr. Catalino Fabio, uh, adding that Vera was unable to locate Duarte's pulse. She speculated that the patient may have suffered from catalepsy, a condition characterized by muscle rigidity and a complete lack of response to outside stimuli. Uh, This isn't the first time a patient has appeared to, quote-unquote, rise from the dead. Uh, In 2015, Queens Medics mistakenly declared a distraught woman deceased after she shot herself in the head. Ow! Then flabbergasted cops discovered she was still alive and transported her to a hospital where she eventually succumbed to her injuries. So there you go. Shoot, see? Resurrected, came back, they had to put her back down. I'm just saying, zombie apocalypse. But she didn't walk the earth as a zombie and eat people. Zombie apocalypse, Tim! They didn't complete the the whole zombie mission. So you failed in that one yet again. Whatever. Meanwhile, people are being killed by robots left and right. All right, my friend. I got to get rolling. Uh, I got stuff to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> Have a great week. Uh, or a weekend, I guess. We'll be back tomorrow with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. That's Tim. I'm Dave. Usually always right. Right here. Uh-huh. On- <laughs>